Now, for the scientists, the lack of precision about states and stages is actually pretty devastating. This is a little bit complicated. So what we have here is experienced meditators, um, in quotes, on the right, and controls on the left on some measure of interest. And this is just a made-up graph. So I just said put attention in there, because that's a really common one. And again, because scientists don't have a background in what makes up contemplative expertise, what types of practices should be, um, that there is any different, any different kinds of practices, um, Scientists have defaulted into hours of practice as that's what makes somebody a good meditator. Um, and so you can see this, this, this is one of the problems that happens. So these guys on the bottom, I'll just come over here. Um, so these guys on the bottom, they've been meditating 5,000 hours, an hour every day, they've been following their breath, really diligent, they have no idea why. Um, <laughs> They, like, they, they, they have, you, if you ask them what the difference between shamatha and vipassana is, they'd be like, I've never heard of those words. Um, this is a common thing in America, by the way. Um, up here, these guys, they trained with Upendita and Pa'ok. They know exactly what they're doing. And there's, they, but they're both considered equal because they all have 5,000 hours. Um, and there's a, there's a euphemism, which is perfect practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. So the quality of your practice matters. And, and as scientists, we haven't been taking that into account. And so what, what the, one of the, the devastating consequences of, of that is that in this model, the, the mean, which is these red lines that you can maybe not quite see, um, they're not different than each other. This is basically saying that there's no difference between meditators and controls on attention. There's no effect of meditation on attention. Um, and so basically, meditation has no effect. You think like, well, well, scientists don't really think that. Well, actually, they do. Um, <laughs> so this is actually the most this is actually the most recent government re report on the state of the research of meditation. So this is sort of like the official word of the government. It was over 400 pages. It reviewed over 800 studies, and it's really long. So you have to find the like the actual conclusions at the bottom. And they say, as a whole, firm conclusions on the effects of meditation practices in healthcare cannot be drawn based on the available evidence. Basically, there's no effective meditation. The central problem, confusion over what constitutes meditation. So how can this be the case? And this, I think for a lot of people, we think that there's so much proof that you know, science is proving that meditation works and all these things. But that's actually that's way overhyped. To, compared to like the actual reality of the situation. So how could this have happened? And I think that you know, it's not all our fault as scientists. I think there's a deeper uh, cultural phenomenon going on, which I'm going to try to illustrate with what I call the blobology effect. The blobology effect, very simply said, is that when you show people, um, when people see colorful blobs on a brain scan, they, they'll con be convinced of anything. <laughs> They can be convinced of anything, even if what you're saying makes no sense, or if it's absolutely preposterous. And even further, people will, will believe brain scans over their own experience. And so there was a study, you've probably seen it, that, um, that the, there was a study that found that brain, the same brain areas light up when you see your cell phone as when you see a loved one. And so people have been concluding that my God, I must be in love with my cell phone. Like, I didn't know that. You know, should I tell my wife? Um, and so it's... The, so the blobology effect on a deeper level is really a symbol of the imbalance between the, in, the inner and outer technologies. Our sense of ourselves, what's going on in our own minds and bodies, is so impoverished that we have to look to colorful blobs on a brain scan to tell us whether we're in love or in pain. Um, and you know, I know there's a lot of excitement about these brain imaging technologies to sort of be this Dharma technology to move things forward, but we're not really there yet. The technology is not there, and it's not because this technology isn't there, it's because this one isn't. The inner technology isn't developed enough, and, it's, and until those two, to, two technologies become even and the inner technology catches up with the outer one, we won't be able to use brain imaging technology to its fullest extent. 
And until then, our love affair with colorful blobs is really just a marketing opportunity and represents the poverty of our inner technology.